Kara Badgley. I am the functional medicine health coach and the clinical coordinator here at Good Medicine. This morning, we are returning to speak more on our latest topic, Stages of Change. Uh, the last blog kind of walked us through and identified what are the stages of change. The idea is when you know where you're at, then hopefully you can look for more resources, more support, more inspiration to help support you in that stage you're in, and then hopefully to move you forward through the stages of change. And that's also comforting to know that it's not from A to B. There are gonna be steps along the way, and that's the whole idea of care plans, is to break it down into really small, reasonable steps to build on success so that we're feeling good about what we're doing rather than feeling overwhelmed because when we feel overwhelmed then we um, start feeling like we're going to shut down like we're going to be paralyzed so um, and then and then change doesn't happen <laughs> and what we need to realize is that in itself is a choice so everything that we are doing is a choice and so today we're going to take a look at well what choices and what can we use to help us move through the stages of change? So to summarize those stages of change, we have pre-contemplation, which is the stage where you do not feel you have a problem, everyone else around you feels you have a problem, and they're coercing you to do something about it. So in other words, denial, which I know both Kara, who is here with me today, um, and myself have been through that stage ourselves, <laughs> as we have addressed some pretty um, serious health health um, situations in our own families. The next phase then is contemplation. Okay, so now you're beginning to realize, you know what, something really is going on and I really do need to do something about it, but you have absolutely no idea what to do. The next step is preparation. You start thinking about it, you start talking about it, you start looking for answers, you start looking to see, well, what can I do about this? Then the Fourth step is action. That's when you actually start putting all that preparation work into action. You start actually making some small lifestyle changes. And then the um, last step is maintenance. And understand that we cycle through these changes forever. So once we get to maintenance on one thing, then we might start again in uh, contemplation, knowing that there's something else we need to work on, but we're not quite sure how to do it. So it's a constant cyclical cycle that we go through with these stages of change. So Kara is here today. She's a former English teacher, and every time she and I talk, she's always reading the most amazing books, and she and I share the belief that we need to read books that aren't necessarily about the chronic condition that we're dealing with in our homes, because that's just kind of further impounding the problem that she and I, she and I have discovered that. So we like to read books that are going to give us a window into more information, more knowledge that will help us then apply it into our lives um, to kind of help bring us up and out of this deep abyss that oftentimes chronic conditions create. So today um, we're reading, or Kara's reading actually, The Gospel of Freedom by Jonathan Ryder. This is a historical book about Dr. King. It was the events leading up to his famous letter from Birmingham jail. And the other day when Kara and I were talking about this, um, she was explaining to me about how, how can these people, how, how can this community of people deal every day with going with this nonviolent protest and um, standing still and quiet in the face of some really tragic, horrific um, events that took place with beatings, tear gassing, dogs, um, and things of the like. And so I wanted her to talk today about, well, how did they... Um, how did they remain nonviolent? What did they do with that fear? Because fear is such an often obstacle of change. So Kara, can you um, jump in and tell me a little bit about what you've been reading and, and what really has spoken to you about that? Yeah, so obviously I am not an expert on civil rights and Dr. King and, you know, clearly as a white woman, I, you know, don't have that personal connection. But what I can Yet, what was new for me in understanding the civil rights movement, and in particular in 1963, and all of the nonviolent protests, was when I was reading, and this was a couple days ago, um, just how everyone involved in the movement, before they went out the next day and protested, that night, every evening, they would meet in their churches, 
and there would be this cathartic release of their fears because they had real life and death fear that they would be facing the next day. I mean, they could at minimum be spit on, at worst beaten or even killed. I mean, that was just, that was the reality. And yet they were able to remain perfectly peaceful and nonviolent in the face of, like you said, these dogs and just the horrible stuff. Um, I'm just having images of Birmingham 1963 and D-Day and the Children's March. So, I, I mean, I've just seen those newsreels. So, um, what struck me is that they dealt with their fear every night. They didn't deny it. There was no covering up. There were no euphemisms. It was, we're meeting in this church and we are exercising our fear through, you know, preaching and call and response and just letting out that anger and that fear, not only verbally through call and response, but through song, but even movement. Um, you know, and if you've ever been in a black church, like, I mean, there is movement, the place is rocking, the rafters are shaking. So like physically releasing that fear and not keeping it stored inside allowed them to do absolutely the impossible, to allow them to face evil with love, to face an enemy with with their own humanity. They didn't lose their humanity in the face of the inhumane treatment. So that spoke to me about my own fears. And even way back in the early days of my husband, Jeff and I trying to just wrestle with what is wrong with our son and really getting ourselves out of denial and facing that fear. And we still facing our fears today and not repressing them, not using strategies to cope with them, but instead face those fears, bring them to the light, talk about them, release them, so then we can act in positive ways. We can act in love and not out of fear, because in that fear, fear just drives us backwards, and fear drives, at least it drives me to do things that I'm ashamed of, that I can't believe I've done, that I say things that I shouldn't have said, um, it keeps me stuck, but when I've addressed my fears and addressing them, really I'm learning more and more is more than just talking about them. It is physically releasing them, whether that's in exercise or in just yoga or whether it's even in cranial sacral treatments. Like, I mean, it is, I've got to release that negative energy so I don't use, so that negative energy doesn't then come out in abusive ways or detrimental ways or ways that could harm rather than heal. So I just find it amazing. I find it ins extremely inspirational and powerful and just, it, it, I don't know, being in Black History Month right now at the end of it and just reading about this and going, wow, like they were doing this, this cathartic release enabled them to do something I can't even imagine. And you stain it. And, and, and sustain, sustain it, it. yes. Yeah, for years, years, right? For years. And years. I really, listening to you talk, it makes me think how the dogs, the tear gas, the beatings, um, they were all symptoms of a much larger th yes. thing happening at the time. And so therefore our chronic condition symptoms that are happening on a daily basis or children's behaviors as a result of their um, diagnosis right in their medical conditions these are all symptoms that we're dealing with each day very similar to the yep. circumstances and the symptoms that um, th this community was dealing with back in the 1950s and 60s and and really still today <laughs> but anyways yeah. that's a yeah. story, right? Right. right but um so i love hearing how what a tool that is for uh, this history to teach us that even today in our own homes to use this to actually address our fear, to bring it to the surface rather than trying to stuff it down. I've worked with a lot of uh, patients or and um, families, parents who say that they just try to stuff down every day um, and not deal with their own emotions because they have to they have to care for whoever they're caring for, especially if they're the caretaker. And then what eventually happens is the caretaker gets sick from stuffing all of that down. Um, and so how powerful to then, you know, give it permission to really come to the surface. Mm -hmm. And the goal is not to keep that door closed. It's to allow the fear to come out. And in that fear will be your greatest intuition, right? Can you? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I mean, for us as a family, 
that we just speak our fears. Like we just talk about them. We don't run from them. I mean, this wasn't easy. This is something that we've learned and practiced it. To be honest, my husband is more naturally bent that way anyway. I mean, he's one that just faces stuff head on and, you know, isn't, doesn't deal in denial very long. Um, I have a harder time with that, but we've had some great models from friends and just even you and other resources that, you know what, we need to face this. Because if we don't face it today, it's going to rear its ugly head sometime and it's going to be unpredictable and untamable and out of control. Whereas we're just going to face it now. Um, even just my son just emerging and dealing with, you know, his own differences and seeing them really for the first time and being so angry um, at God for giving him the body that he gave him. And he's so mad. And, you know, we were sitting on the steps and he's just emoting and just erupting with this anger. And, you know, in the past, I would have said, oh, honey, everything's going to be okay. You're fine. You know, let's not talk that way. Let's think positive. <laughs> and, and it's like, no, we need to sit in these emotions and we need to let them come to the surface. And, you know, I'm learning, validating them and empathizing and yes, let's get them out and then, you know, once we've got those emotions out and they're on the table and we see them and we bring them to the light of day, when we're in a calmer state, then we talk about them and then we engage in them and we go, okay, but, you know, let's talk about that. You know, God made your body this way and what does that mean and where do we go from here and why are we doing what we're doing? And, um, but a letting our emotions just be, like just living with them and existing with them um, and not stuffing them because then it does it's just amazing what it does for healing the body emotionally and physically and spiritually. Absolutely. And it also reminds me hearing you talk about your family is just that chronic conditions oftentimes are a tap on the shoulder to help us remember how to have healthy relationships, not only with other people, but with ourselves. And a lot of uh, a large component of a healthy relationship is communication. And when we're stuffing anger and fear, oftentimes we will have misplaced anger, where we are angry at someone out of nowhere, they have no idea where that just came from. And then the atmosphere in the home becomes more and more toxic. Can you talk a little bit more about how you create that atmosphere in the home that's conducive to healing? with your communication and, and with more of strategies that you use um, in your own family? Yeah, I think, honestly, it's it's me. I'm the one that, that has to do more of that work than my husband. Like I said, he's, I mean, obviously working too, but he's just got that bent. He's just more, he's always been more in tune with his emotions. Um, and so for me, it is literally learning, backing up to square one and going, okay, how am I feeling right now? Okay, I'm angry. All right, I'm angry. But wait, what's underneath that anger? Because for me, you know, anger is just, that's on the surface. That's masking what's really underneath. And so then I make myself just step back and go, okay, what's underneath that? Usually for me, then I go, well, I'm angry because I'm, well, I'm feeling uncomfortable. I'm feeling frustrated. Wait, I'm feeling, I'm feeling alone. I'm feeling isolated. I'm feeling um, abandoned. I'm feeling unknown. I'm feeling unloved. And then I really get to the root of it. And for me, it always comes down to, I, I don't feel known and I don't feel loved. And, you know, addressing that, okay, why don't I feel loved and why don't I feel known? Because you know, what? I am known. I am known by God and I am loved by him. So bottom line, those two are met, but I'm not feeling that. So what's going on that I can address? And then once I address and I, I sit in those feelings and go, yeah, that's how I'm feeling. I notice I'm breathing more. I'm oxygenating, oxygenating my brain more. Like I'm able to get out of that fight or flight mode because that's where my anger is. Like it's way back there in that reptilian brain, right? And I'm just like lashing out. And I'm not engaging the higher levels, you know, in my brain and the thinking because I can't because I, but as soon as I acknowledge that fear, it just tames it down. And I start to just go, okay, I can manage, I can move on, I can make a next step, I can and, and engage a stressful situation with 
calm and love and centeredness. Now, do I do this perfectly? Absolutely not. Am I, it's a practice. I'm continually, continually working on it, but I've made so much progress with myself and identifying my feelings and really what's going on that then it affects my whole family. Then I'm able to connect with my children and like, you know, my daughter's having a meltdown and she's, you know, flipping out over, I have no idea what. And I'm like, okay, are you feeling? And I start to just give her feeling words. Are you feeling frustrated? Are you feeling unheard? Are you feeling left out? And all of a sudden, she just starts to calm down. And it happens pretty quickly, even with my son, you know, who is, who's on the spectrum, works for him too. I mean, it's just because acknowledging and validating feelings. They don't have all those words. Yeah. So helping them giving those words, that's what we just do. And physically, the body just, even I watch, relaxes. And then we take a moment to just start breathing. Let's listen to our breathing. Let's focus on breathing and let's just get the bad out, bring the good in. Um, those are, I guess, some of the strategies. That yeah, I love it. it. Gosh, I have so many thoughts in my <laughs> head from listening to you about, um, let's talk about how the anxiety, that fear releases that cortisol, which does shift your nervous system into that sympathetic nervous system, that fight or flight, where everything is shutting down. We're creating so much inflammation that everything's being suffocated. Literally, like you said, your breath and your thoughts, your intelligence, your way of being able to think through and be solution oriented so if we're not addressing that fear we're going to remain locked in that sympathetic nervous system which is one of the reasons why we're experiencing chronic conditions in the first place is because we're so used to operating in that mode and so it's really important that from here forward we learn a different way of operating to move more into the parasympathetic nervous system which is that rest and digest where we can breathe where we can access that frontal um lobe right which is where the higher intelligent thinking of the brain section is um and be able to access our intuition and to know more what to do in the moment whereas when we're frozen and that flight in fear mode, then everything just stops. We have no idea what to do. We're stuck in that pre-contemplation, contemplation mode. Right. And then we go back to old patterns and old behaviors that are detrimental, things that we learned either as children or that were modeled for us, or maybe just because, I mean, that don't work. And then we just keep going backwards and the cycle. Right. Is and therefore, we're never able to live this lifestyle that's going to foster us to get better because we're remaining in the patterns right. um, that we're used to that have brought us to this point in time. So thank you, Kara. I love how you're reading these books and applying it into your life to get a broader understanding of how do we take all of this head knowledge. We know we everyone needs to eat better. Everyone knows they need to exercise more. Like all of that knowledge is very available, but really how do we move through these stages of change to begin to live this life, I think is the real mystery. And I feel this has given a lot of great insight. And so some of your, um, to capture your best advice, uh, to summarize and then jump in, please, I hear, you know, yoga and breathing and just giving yourself permission to feel these feelings and help others in your family to feel them because there is a lot of fear associated in life and in particular with chronic conditions. And so can you add to any more advice on um, that you have just to summarize of moving through these stages and addressing the fear? I think it's just, I mean, where I'm at right now, I mean, we just make space and make time for just processing and doing life. I mean, it, it really is like, that's what we have to do. My husband and I and our family to figure this out, to get through. Sometimes it's just getting through that day or that, that experience, that crisis, whatever it is. And it's remembering to just give space to it. Um, and yeah, less is more. I mean, that's just how, that's how we do this. And when there's a large crisis in the home, which is so relevant, right, to chronic conditions in the autism spectrum, um, how do you clear your home? How do you bring it back to that feeling of being a headquarters for healing, for nurturing? The biggest thing is that my husband and I make sure we're on the same page. I mean, we have to. 
Um, usually that's him reminding me, um, but getting back, okay, wait, what's the big picture here? What, why are we doing all of this? Wait, remember where we were, right? Even just a few months ago, a couple years ago, and just remembering and celebrating how far we've come and not focusing on um, the crisis. It's really is, okay, this is a bump in the road. This is part of the healing process. This is part of the journey. The waves, they come and they go, like they ebb and they flow. Like that's just how it does it. We're on a positive trajectory. There's going to be step backs. That's just what it is. So calling it what it is and then reminding ourselves where we came from and where we are headed, that's huge for us. And just staying connected, checking in with each, checking in with ourselves. How am I feeling? Where am I at right now? checking in with each other we're a team remember we're a team my husband always says it remember we're a team <laughs> on this um we're together and then the kids just come around i mean it just happens like if i'm centered my husband's centered we come together as a team the kids come together too it, that's just that's just what it is um we model it and we got to make sure that we're we're healthy. Right. So. And you're able to model it because of this understanding of your fears and of yes. embracing them. <clears throat> not, I mean, if we sense any denial creeping in, we're like, okay, what's going on here? We got to address it. Right. And, and you had said something too about, you know, setbacks. We are going to experience setbacks. We are going to experience regressions. This is going to be a part of it. And so when you find yourself sliding back, even from action into um, preparation or even way back into contemplation where you're just kind of frozen, know that that is normal and to speak to yourself kindly and to give yourself permission to have that time um, and know that your body is is going through regressions because it's having to rework itself in an entirely different way and to support yourself through those regressions to be even more nurturing, to allow time for more sleep, to allow time for more hydration um, so that you don't feel like you always have to be pushing forward is what I'm trying to say. Yes, exactly. You can just even just stay put for a really long time. You don't have forward momentum doesn't have to, I mean, it doesn't always have to be action oriented. It doesn't have to be action oriented. And I think, and this is something I'm really working on and I, I get is, and you've talked a lot about this, the self care piece. And I think in our culture and especially, you know, in, as a Christian, even in my Christian circles, like, Oh, you're not supposed to be worried about yourself and taking care of yourself. Like, you know, self sacrifice and serving others, but there's no way I can do that. And that call to care for others until I, have cared for myself. Um, and that is a huge deal. I mean, that self care, that caretaker wellness and making sure that my mind, body and spirit are whole and on our healing path. Like I can't even begin to help my family until I've taken care of myself. There is no, there is no shame and there's no guilt in caretaker wellness. Like there's none of that. Like, so when we have a crisis, we pull back and we are like, we got to take care of ourselves, whatever that happens to be. And then our family, you know, and that, then the circle goes out from there. I mean, it just, you have to, it's, it's essential. And I get pushed back from people around me, my culture or whatever, when I go and do my, you know, my little treatments, oh, your little fun spa day is I guess how <laughs> I think people see it. I'm like, this is not a fun spa day. Like this is work and this is really important. And, um, yeah, you're facing your deep, I'm facing agony, my your deep fears. agony. You're right. Yes, I'm right. facing my fears. I'm dealing with them so then I can live the abundant life that, you know, God has provided for me to live and he's called me to live, like to have that life and have it in abundance. I want that. How do I do that? I got to make sure that I'm well and whole so I can hear the spirit and I can respond, like you said, that intuition and hear the spirit's guidance. Because if I'm in fight or flight mode and I'm all fear and stuff in it all, there's no way I can hear Right. That. Right. Nobody will heal around. Well, thank you so much, Kara. So Gospel Freedom by Jonathan Ryder. That is our uh, recommendation for the month of February. And we will be back in March to talk about another book that has given us inspiration to take a look at the big picture. How do we um, kind of plug and play? How do we take all this information and actually make it applicable into our lives and walk through these stages of change? Um, so that we are moving more towards our goal rather than feeling that we're just kind of um, recirculating in our old patterns. So thanks for joining us and we'll see you next month.